Kia ora, talofa, namaste, hi to my, and welcome to this week's episode of The Niche Cast. We are here in Aotearoa, trying to be like a supple flax bush wildcard. That was the word I was looking for in the variety show. Yeah, I forgot to message you when I edited that. I remember, I didn't, I didn't pick what you're saying at the time. And when I heard it back on the edit, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, well, supple, that's what he's going for. Just trying to be a supple flax bush enjoying a rainy kiwi summer it's beautiful enjoying the rain enjoying the uh whatever's happening with the seasons and the rotation of the earth how about that wild card i'm also trying to figure out some some nuance and some we don't need to go deep into the mangroves here for a little warm-up quarter but i do want to explore a little bit just the nuance and some differences between kiwi franchises competing in australian competitions and how they fit into the greater sporting landscape because the Ben Wayne transfer got me thinking about developing players and there was a clear benefit for the Wellington Phoenix on any young footballer that comes up through the Wellington Phoenix they might get too proficient for the Wellington Phoenix and they have a world of opportunity out there but any possible suitors have to pay the Wellington Phoenix money to get that player um, out of their contract. And that's a transfer fee. And there's a route for football clubs around the world to run a fine business practice just developing talent. That is very different to the Aotearoa Warriors. If the Warriors develop a player and that player leaves the Warriors, well, we all know that yarn well because that's what everyone complains about. There's no kickback to the Warriors for the for developing that player and then that player moving on to a bigger, bigger, better deal because like obviously the the structure of the sports is different. And then you've got the Breakers where I think the Breakers have done well to get back into a more Kiwi vibe and reconnecting with Aotearoa, a few more Kiwi basketball players in their system. But as you said pre-show, there's no uh there's no there's nothing below the breakers the breakers could have a b team that competes in any number of competitions most notably the nbl the breakers barely have like visible public academies and development farms and everything it's very much just a a one level organization i think and i'm looking at all of this through the warriors lens so i looked at that ben wayne situation through the warriors lens and how uh because everyone complains about the Warriors releasing their juniors to go to other clubs and Phoenix just released a junior for a decent transfer fee and it benefits the Phoenix. And then everyone complains about the Warriors, yet the Breakers don't even have teams or layers below the NBL team. And like my final thought with all of that was, off the top of my head, haven't done a deep dive into the numbers but the Warriors have the same amount of Kiwi talent as the Phoenix and the Breakers. So again, everyone's complaining about the Warriors and how they, um, the issues with developing local talent and um, all their woes and recruitment at the junior level, but they just have the same as the Phoenix and the Breakers. And obviously they're kind of moving in different directions. I just said the Breakers have got back to something. They were struggling for a period there. There's been great patches for the Warriors and whatnot, but those are just a couple of ideas that came to mind on a very specific Kiwi sporting pocket and the perception of those three clubs and how they work with local talent. Yeah, that's it's a weird um, difference, isn't it, between the Phoenix and the Warriors, where if the Phoenix develop a player and sell them to a League One team in England, as they've just done, big victory for the phoenix if the warriors develop a solid junior player and then he goes and signs with the sydney roosters disaster for the warriors like this is a terrible thing what have they done they can't retain their juniors like there's a there's a weird little um yeah like <laughs> opposing forces at play there i guess it's just the um it, it's the the nature of those sports and the fact that the warriors are in the pinnacle 
sort of league of their sport so there's not it's not like there's an nba or a premier league above them to to be able to sell players to and um provide that pathway but the warriors do a decent job of bringing through there's every year there's several like I, I would imagine if you looked at homegrown players in the NRL, the Warriors would be one of the betters in terms of like the percentage of their minutes played from players that they brought up um, themselves from below. Like they're the first team that gave them an NRL shot sort of thing. Like the Phoenix, I know, uh, would be high on that list um, in the A-League for sure. Their academy is doing outstanding things at the moment. Um, there's in under 17 Oceania championships that have just started. And there was a Phoenix kid, uh, Luke Supic, who scored a hat-trick in their first game beating, I think it was New Caledonia 3-2, which um, the under 17s is a tournament where the, the, the score lines against the Oceania teams are closer than you'll get in any other thing. Cause it's the first time these kids have gone over played in the islands. Um, they haven't had the exposure to professional stuff so much yet. And it's just, the whole thing is very difficult um, to get accustomed to and cli like acclimatize. So you do get much closer go go um, games in those tournaments. But yeah, the that squad heavily influenced by Wellington Phoenix Academy players. The under-19s Oceania Championships that happened last year, heavily influenced by Wellington Phoenix Academy players. You're seeing the very top tier of the academy. Like most of the players aren't going to get leave. They're going to leave on free transfers because they don't get senior contracts or they're going to um, leave at the end of their senior contract because they don't get a second one. Or um, it, It's a very rare case where you get someone like Sapreet Singh, Libby Kikache, Ben Wayne, who are so good that overseas teams are buying them out before their contract ends. But one of those every couple of years is still a massive financial boost to the club. It's it's free money. You you um you not you didn't have to buy Ben Wayne in the first place. You just brought him up from when he was a kid, and then you get a big profit off the end of it after he scored seventeen A League goals for the club. Like that's it's just there's a there's a lot of sports where you see this, and football is one of the most prominent. And I think league and basketball also is the same thing. Like probably most team sports is the same. If you can develop your own players you just got such a head start. If you can develop head, your own players on that kind of level, it's just such a boost ahead of everyone else. And I do think this is... I, I cut the breakers some slack here because we know how far off the tracks they got over the last sort of five years. And we've seen that this year, they're, they're writing things. You know, they're, they're fixing a lot of those issues. They've reconnected with the sort of... Um, the the roots of the club they've got a they've got that kiwi core back and um you know coach modi may always made that an emphasis and so i can see this being like the first step along a journey but at, as it stands the breakers like you say they don't have there's, there's no reason why they couldn't have a reserve team in the nznbl the break uh, the phoenix do the exact same thing in the new zealand national league they're under 20s playing that league the breakers could do that exact thing. Just have like an academy team. You get one of your assistant coaches to take charge. One of their assistant coaches actually is, I signed on to coach, I think it's Franklin for the um, 2023 uh, NZ season. So that in itself is nice. And you do get breakers players who occasionally will um, go and play some NBL in their off season. They, you, you probably a little bit less of that recent times. COVID's probably been a factor in that as well, though, to be fair, it's not just the breakers being like, no, nah, no, nah, you don't need to do that stuff um but they could just have a a team of 15 20 the best players under the age of like 23 or something like that or even some of them pre-college some of them just come back from college in the states some of them didn't go to college in the states like they could just have a little army of players and then I don't know, the three best ones each year you chuck in your dp roles you can still have a next star the next star doesn't count towards your development players the next star doesn't count towards your main roster it's a free extra spot on your roster because the Aussie NBL uh, powers that be wants players from overseas to come and play a year, then get drafted because it boosts the profile of their league. They they want that, so it's a free player on top of the thing. It doesn't affect the fact that that's you know it doesn't affect your squad building or anything. And hopefully the Breakers will do that in the next couple of years. Like it's as we say, they've they've only just fixed the first team's issues, let alone the stuff beneath that so hopefully that's a, a process that happens at the moment they're mostly just developing french players but um no, they're on the right track to change that in the future and maybe start getting a few kiwi dps coming through on the more regular 
How many teams does the Wellington Phoenix have below A League? Is it just the one team that competes in the National League, or is there another youth team as well? Um, I don't know exactly, but yeah, they've got like under seventeens and under fifteens and stuff who would who don't play on it. Like they would just play in their local um, uh, what do you call them? It's like Wellington leagues, I I think uh, probably assuming they're still doing that under the lower hut banner that's what at least that's what it was in the past is that those the best phoenix players who are in the academy whether they're like 13 14 15 year olds would be playing for lower huts um cities equivalent teams and it's effectively like a branch out thing from the Knicks. um there was some stuff like that because i think the wellington phoenix now have just basically taken over that license but i assume below that uh, below the first team level that would still be the case i'm not I'm not actually sure though it's not a level i follow too closely below like national league um conferences because it's it's too difficult like it's too frisky at that point but it is to say that the wellington phoenix have multiple levels below the a league oh yeah yeah definitely. feeding into the a league team the warriors Obviously, the pandemic kind of took that away a wee bit, so they had to connect with Redcliffe Dolphins. But coming into the 2023 season, they're going to have the New South Wales Cup team. They're going to have an SG Ball team. And then apparently they want to get into Harold Matthews, which is below SG Ball, and also Jersey Flag, which is above SG Ball. So you're looking at two levels chucking the future Warriors right now, which would become the Harold Matthews. You're roughly looking at... What are the, what are the age grades there? SG Ball is now under 19. Jersey right. Flegg is now under 21s. Harold Matthews, I think, is under 16, under 17. So you're roughly looking at three, maybe four levels below NRL that the Warriors have it sorted. That puts into context the Breakers situation. And like right now, the Warriors were well, with Redcliffe, like there wasn't really anything. So that also puts context around the Breakers stuff. Like, now that they're established back in Aotearoa, they can start to build those things. But it's just interesting to kind of map those things out because everyone assumes that they are all the same and that there's no real... I think once you dive into it, uh, things become a lot clearer. And you mentioned the the value of like the transfer fee and developing a player that way to get a profit. I think back to that Ben murdoch Masilla stuff and... Obviously, you can't get a transfer fee in the NRL, but you do get salary cap value. And this is something we talk a lot about because Ben murdoch Masilla has now signed with the Dragons, right? And I'm telling you, you're the resident Dragons aficionado fanboy. So I'm telling you, Ben murdoch Masilla, I think he'll play about 10 games. And I don't think he will play more than 30 minutes in any of those 10 games. Maybe if everything goes honkadori, Ben murdoch Masilla might play 20 games. And I, again, don't think he's playing more than 30 minutes in any of those games. So are you going to pay someone 300, 400, 500k to play less than 15 games and less than 25 minutes in all of those games? Or are you going to pay someone 100k to play less than 15 games and play 20 minutes in those 15 games. So you're not receiving a transfer fee, but you are finding value in the salary cap by promoting your local juniors through that system. And obviously we're just talking like guys like Tom LA and the Kepu twins, their value is in the limited roles they will play at a lower price compared to the older, more experienced NRL player who everyone seems to think was a not an instrumental figure, but he, like, I think his value for the Warriors was overstated because he didn't really play much. And that's where the value is for the the Warriors. I don't really know where that value sits in the NBL with the Breakers, but we'll keep thinking about it. We'll keep pondering that, and we'll keep uh, working through it. We'll keep stretching through it, swing a leg, and do some warm-up corridor around it. In the future, big up the Niche cast. We are here from the Niche case, www.thaniche-case.com. Big Altero Sporting Yarns on the website right now. Stephen Adams breakdown. Got a Black Sticks Hockey World Cup preview. Got the White Fern Super Smash Mixer. Got the Flying Kiwis live. There's a Phoenix Yarn there as well. Black Caps Test Series debrief. It's all there as per usual. The niche-cache.com. Early in the week, 
We recorded our Patreon podcast, which also goes out to our paid Substack subscribers. We just dove deep into the Black Caps test series and everything there. Like we got pretty, uh, pretty funky, got some Neil Wagner, got some spin situations, the future of Henry Nichols. Pick up the Patreon whānau and everyone who supports the niche cage uh, via Patreon or Substack subscriptions. There's that extra podcast for you every week as well. And we try to make those podcasts driven by ideas, thoughts, and questions from the Patreon Fano. So sign up to Patreon to support the niche case directly. Patreon.com forward slash L niche case, E L niche case. And then every Monday and Friday, we also send out our email newsletter via Substack, the niche case.substack.com. Always monstrous Aotearoa sporting yarns in those email newsletters as well. And Substack does have a paid subscription option if that is your buzz. Otherwise, just check in with the website, enjoy the podcast, tell a friend, share the positive vibes, and just be a good person. How about that? Don't even help us, just help yourself and be a good person. Chieftain, we always start with a dose of mindfulness. What do you got? Yeah, mindfulness today, slightly different formula because I'm going with the, what would you call it? An exercise in perspective. So here's, I'll read out the quote and then I'll tell you who said it because that puts, that's where the perspective comes from. The quote is, children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. Uh, children are now tyrants, now the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents. They chatter before company, gobble up dainties at the table, cross their legs, and tyrannize their teachers. The person who said that was Socrates, old, old Greek uh, philosopher, mate, more than 2,000 years ago. You think about that. Like, the, the, that, could have been, the, <laughs> that, that could have been anyone's uncle saying that. It was actually Socrates more than 2,000 years ago, which sticks to an idea that I kind of have, which is that human nature doesn't change. Um, people have been saying the same things about the next generation for the, since, since the first generation had a second generation, pretty much. I think that's when that, uh, I think that's when that pattern started. Fabulous. Don't need to add anything to that. That is a... Uh... Just a fabulous bit of mindfulness. Let's crack into some Aotearoa sport. And I just want to highlight the Black Sticks men. They are starting their World Cup campaign on Saturday. They got a game against Chile. They are in Pool C, which means they face Chile, Netherlands, and Malaysia. And just looking through some of the results of like Black Sticks hockey, obviously another sport heavily impacted by the pandemic. But I think interestingly, last year was the Commonwealth Games, and that was the first time that neither team has won a Commonwealth Games medal. So you think back to the previous Commonwealth Games on the, on the Gold Coast, which was 2018, the women won a gold medal and the men won a silver medal. In 2022, neither team won a medal. So that's kind of a, a nice measuring stick for Kiwi hockey right now. And then for the men you flow into, they had some pro league games last year against Spain and India. They lost the first three games and that featured two games against India in which they conceded 11 goals. Then they had a 1-1 draw with Spain, which they did manage to get a shootout victory. So that was cool. That was their last major international game. So I put a, you know, Take some positivity from that uh, draw and shootout victory into this uh, World Cup campaign. And it's, it's an interesting one because their pool, or, or every pool, the top three teams qualify for crossover fixtures. So three out of the four teams qualify for the next phase. And I think there's a chance the Kiwis could finish second they should get victories over Chile and Malaysia. They probably won't manage much against the Netherlands because they're one of the best teams in the world. So you might, so it's going to be like really hard for the Black Sticks men not to qualify. Even though Kiwi hockey has kind of reached the mediocre plateau, it's still really hard for them not to qualify for the next stage. 
thinking back to the Commonwealth Games, their first game there was a 5-5 draw against Scotland, which is, is an example of the sobering reality of Kiwi hockey right now is that a draw with Scotland happened in the first Commonwealth Games fixture, and they also had a loss against South Africa. But that first up game against Scotland, I think it's another measuring stick for this team at the World Cup because their first game is going to be against Chile, who have only come onto the international scene in force over the past four to five years and might be like they're in this World Cup. Scotland's not in this World Cup. So in theory, they are as good, if not better than Scotland. So how the Kiwis perform against Chile will be really interesting. And then um, moving forward into the game against Netherlands and Malaysia, I think they, they'll be pretty happy if they get two victories. And as I mentioned, in the Pro League games, they conceded a lot of goals. They conceded at least three goals in their first three games. So like if Chile is scoring four goals against the Black Sticks, that's not a good sign. Because... That draw against Scotland was 5-5. So Scotland scored five goals against the Kiwis. So I think the defensive stuff is going to be really interesting, um, which is helped by, I think, Nick Ross is back in the squad. He's going to play in the midfield, probably like central midfield with Nick Woods, who is the skipper. you still got Blair Tarrant and Kane Russell in the defensive line as well. The defense wasn't very good in those pro league games, like a lot of turnovers in the midfield that puts pressure on your man-to-man -man marking at the back and a lot of like, just, well, not a lot of marking in defense, let's say that, especially when you're playing, conceding a lot of goals against India. And there has been another wrinkle with Simon Child returning to Black Sticks hockey. And his presence is pretty interesting because I... I think he, he's, a, he's a striker, but he drops back into the midfield. So that's a pretty clear, like, football comparison to make. Like, there's a lot of uh, the false yeah, nine, Lionel right? Messi. <laughs> yeah. Well, he is the Lionel Messi of New Zealand hockey. Like, so it's a, it's a fair comparison. But the striker who drops back into the midfield pockets and then does a bit of playmaking. Simon Child is excellent at that. And there's a good balance of strikers who work hard around him again similar to Argentina around Messi, where you've got a lot of dudes busting their ass to do a lot of the work around the focal point in attack. So I think that's a massive... Well, Argentina won their World Cup, so that's a good sign. I think Argentina might win this, this World Cup as well, because Argentina are really <laughs> good at go. hockey. So, so um, that might happen. Um, and there's also, like, there is... The Kiwis have returned to playing club hockey in Europe, Got old Sam Lane and Sean Finlay, two young lads from Aotearoa. They've been playing in the Netherlands. I think a couple of other lads have been playing in Germany. There might be other lads playing in Europe who are unavailable for the squad as well. So that's all good. I think this is just going to be a a solid World Cup, and it, that's a solid World Cup should be all good, I reckon, given where Kiwi hockey has been over the past few years. Um, and again. Defense will have to be on point against Chile and Malaysia, especially. And then you're looking, everything revolves around Simon Child in attack, just his touches, his passing, let alone if you give him space in the circle and or if a defender's just sitting on the ball, like Simon Child's going to take that ball off him and put it in the back of the net. So it's a good bonus for the Black Six men to have him back in the mix. And there's a, there are some impressive youngsters in the squad as well that I'll be tracking to see how they perform on the international stage. Beauty. Um, so it's just the men's World Cup, right? The women's World Cup isn't happening concurrently as you had, obviously, the Commonwealth Games. Everything happens at once, but it's not the same Women's World Cup was last then? year. Last year, right. And the and the woman, I think they finished fifth at the Women's World Cup last year, which was a pretty good result. But then they didn't get a medal at the Commonwealth Games like a few weeks later. Right. So it was like uh, a bit stink. But um, so, yeah, we'll be tracking this closely. Did a massive preview on the website and we'll probably be updating the games in the corresponding email newsletter. So we'll be wrapping up the Chile game in our Monday newsletter and we'll be following this closely. Well, kind of another 
thing we follow closely from the Aotearoa sporting landscape is big old Steve, Stephen Adams and the Memphis Grizzlies. You've done a big debrief that is live on our website at the moment. Last time we checked in with Stephen Adams, Jaron Jackson Jr. was returning to the lineup and a bit of curiosity about his combination with Stephen Adams, how they're going to perform together. Stephen Adams, if I remember correctly, was horrible from the free throw line, but he's really good rebounding. And the Memphis Grizzlies were a pretty good team. What has changed? How's it changed? And how Stephen Adams free throws at the moment? Well, the free throws are as bad as ever. There's nothing changing there. He, uh, this most recent game, they play again this afternoon, so that'll happen before um, before this podcast goes live. But they played. San, actually, they play the San Antonio Spurs both times, I think. I think they got a back-to-back or... No, there's a day in between. Um, the first game against the Spurs, he shot 11 free-throw attempts and made three of them, which is you know, a little bit below his season average of about 35% or something like that, which is way below his career average of about 55%, which has actually dipped a bit because of this year. Um, but coming into the season, 55%. 11 is the most he shot in any game all season. And there were definitely once or twice um, where it looked like the Spurs were doing it on purpose. <laughs> you know, like, uh, that's just, uh, we need to, we need a quick position here later in the game, trying to get a comeback. Let's just foul their big guy, let him make or miss a couple free throws. If he makes them, fair enough, but we expect them to miss at least one and we'll take our chances a um, couple times as well. It's like, I think it was probably a a, a deliberate Popovich um, instruction. Be like, well, we don't want this guy getting offensive rebounds. But if he does get offensive rebounds, wrap him up quickly so at least we can hope to hopefully waste that position with him at the free throw line rather than kicking it out to a three-point shooter or going up and dunking it himself. Um, there were one or two times where that was definitely, a, it had to have been a, I don't think it's a coincidence he shot 11 free throw, free throw attempts in that game, I'm saying. And that could be something that continues. But also, you know, he's the best offensive rebounder in the NBA. He led the NBA in all three major uh, measurements for that last year, total offensive rebounds per game, offensive rebounds and percentage. Same thing's happening this year. Every time he gets an offensive rebound, that's a shot that's been missed, which goes straight into his team having another possession without the other team touching the ball in between. It's a he basically cancels out that first missed shot. Like he he's he wipes missed shots off the board by rebounding so well. The fact that he misses some free throws doesn't balance out against the overwhelming positives that he provides for them. It's just a thing where it's like, well, if you could be a little bit better, it would be nice. Um his shot looks wonky as well. I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but hopefully that's something the coaches maybe can get a, get in his air at all-star break or something when they've got a little bit of time and not just worrying about this game, next game, game after that kind of rhythm. Um, and other than that, you know, there was a little bit of a spell. This is kind of what the, the latest article was about with him. There was a spell where the Grizzlies lost four out of five games late last year. Um, Looking a bit slow. One of those was a loss to the Thunder, which is something you probably shouldn't really be doing, even though the Sun- Thunder are playing some pretty frisky basketball this year. They're, they're, some of those young fellas, they've got like Josh Giddy scoring 20 points a game now. He's he's looking real good. Um, and Jay Gilgis Alexander is genuinely blossoming into a, a legit all star. Um, but you don't really want to be a contending team losing to the Oklahoma City Thunder and this year when they're still, uh, for at least one more year, still in tank mode. And yeah, for looking a little bit sloppy. They were missing a bunch of three-pointers. Well, since then, they've won seven games in a row. Uh, this is before the second Spurs game, which I think they'll probably win that and make it eight in a row and see how that goes. They've played some relatively cushy teams in that spell, but also they've got back to playing Memphis basketball. And that means extremely good defense. It means uh, John Morant's missed one or two games in that, but he's still like also had games where he's been like the game that they broke that losing run. He had a career high in assists. So that's John Morant doing a little bit of everything there. Um, defensively, you got Jaron Jackson Jr. Is going to lead the NBA in blocks, even though he missed the first quarter of the season. Like he's not there yet, but once you give a, the rest of the half of the season, he's, he's going to be, he's well out. And so I think the, 
in terms of per games, he hasn't played enough games to count on the, like the, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, they have like a cutoff point where if you haven't played enough, your per game averages don't show up on the, on the main stats. He hasn't quite reached that yet, but he will over the rest of the season. He's averaging, I think, 3.3 blocks per game and the next best is 2.6 or something. So he's way out in front. Um, Dylan Brooks is the dude who guards the perimeter. He picks the, if the, they're playing a team with a superstar point guard. That's Dylan Brooks's job. He'll get on them and, and shut them down. He's brilliant at that. Jaron Jackson Jr. might be the defensive player of the year. And then you've got Stephen Adams as your third best defender. Well, that's pretty good. If he's your third best defender, you're in a nice place. And he's he's upped his blocks as well this year, which is a bit weird. He's Because I remember him going on the Zach Lowe podcast a couple of years ago, talking about how he's he used to celebrate when he saw his blocks start to go down after his first couple of years because it meant guys weren't attacking him and shooting on him so much. It meant he was deterring them from getting to their shot. And he's like, well, that means I've done a better job of defending by preventing them from even attempting a shot. But his blocks are going back up now. And I think that's because he's reached a point where he's, he can't just be a deterrent. Like he's, he's got um, Jaron Jackson Jr. next to him, just making these blindside blocks all over the show and looking incredible at it. Adams is just joining in the fun now. They're just causing chaos. Like that's the best rim protecting duo in the in the NBA. I got to think um, the stats back that up at least. So defensively, they looked really good. And then also, Stephen Adams is on the best rebounding run of his entire career. Like he had a, I think he had a at one point he had a twenty one rebound game and then a twenty three re- rebound game in a row. Um, in the last like since the new year started, he's I think tied his record for. Um, overall rebounds in the games hide his record for offensive rebounds in the game something like that two separate games as well uh, he's just gone absolutely nuts with those things um this this is what memphis grizzlies are supposed to be doing you know they're just back to the way that they should be playing basketball and they're looking very very good and it was a nice run of fixtures that have really helped them um but they got a few more nice runs of fixtures coming up too and you you win those and you see where you can finish in the at the end of the season like they're they could legitimately be the top seed in the West. Like if they continue the run they're going, they they one of the teams who are in contention for that. You think about like, I think a lot of people seem to rate the Clippers, I guess, because Kawhi will start playing more regularly or whatever. And if they're healthy, they are a very good team, well coached. Um, we know how good Golden State are, but those teams didn't have good starts to the season. Dallas didn't have a good start to the season. Phoenix to have a uh, Phoenix are looking pathetic at the moment. They're losing all over the place. Phoenix and Dallas were the Western Conference finalists last year. Denver are really good. Denver's probably the favorites to finish first in the West, but Memphis are right up there with them. So this is a this this is the Memphis Grizzlies taking the steps they're supposed to take in the year after their first big playoff run last season. Like this is they're doing what they're supposed to be doing now. I was just trying to think of an NRL team who are like the Clippers, where it's like many people were picking them to win the win the NBA or make the NBA finals this year with out doing anything like barely getting their team on the park and I'm thinking like is there an yeah. NRL team who everyone loves even though they don't do anything but no team stood out and then you mentioned the Phoenix Suns I was like oh it kind of feels like the Broncos but um it's just <laughs> that's just the uh, NRL joke of the week at the moment I do like the complementary skill sets of Jaron Jackson Jr who's a really good three-point shooter Stephen yep. Adams can barely make a free throw so he's not going to shoot a three-pointer and then they work together defensively as well like it just seems like one of the best big men to have alongside Stephen Adams and it's part of a really good Memphis Grizzlies team closer to home we did mention the breakers at the start and they're just in a very busy patch of uh, NBL fixtures. So we're just going to leave them on ice and just see how they roll through these next period of games um, in the NBL. Did you have a, uh, any final Stephen Adams thoughts there? Um, no. Uh, I mean, other than just saying that, the I guess the one thing I'd add to your point on the combination between Jackson and Adams is that it's definitely taken a new step this year. And Jackson missed the first 15, 20 games or something with injury. Um, So there was a little bit of a period of adjustment as well when he came back. But definitely the way they've been playing over this win streak, like those two, is not how they played together last year. Like they were good last year. They've gone to another level this year. I think they just probably have reached a point where they understand those complementary skill sets 
even more so like there's a familiarity there's um because last year was Adam's first year on the team so obviously he was even though people sort of loved him pretty straight away he was still new and adjusting to the team and more probably more important young players who hadn't played necessarily with a guy of his um of his uh skill set they were adjusting to him and I think a couple of things, because it's not just the Jackson and Adams combination. I think also the Morant and Adams combination looks a little bit different this year where you're seeing um, a little bit more. I'm not sure if the stats back this up, but it feels like a little bit more of a sort of pick and roll um, game going on, which getting back to like Adams and Russ back in the day, but also the the screen game and Morant um, trying to play make off of those Adams sort of uh, ball screens like that's, that feels like it's probably been even more of an emphasis this year where it's like they've figured out they've got this thing that can work and now they know how to make it work pretty much whenever they need it like that too. Um, so yeah, as to the breakers, like they played a breakers played a Wednesday game, I think away, then we're home on Sunday. Then we're away in Perth on Tuesday. Then tonight on Thursday, they play at home in Christchurch actually. And then on uh sunday i think they have another game um against ken's i think so that's like five games from wednesday to wednesday to the next sunday so wednesday thursday for it's like five games in about 12 days or something like that so yeah i think it's probably safest just to say whatever they do over this stretch um fatigue is going to be a factor this is absolutely brutal they're doing some covid catch-ups from their stuff but the end of last year so there's, it's maybe more a case of let's see how they come out of this period rather than what they do in this period. Also, do, do we want to uh, big up Sean Marks? We've been yeah, riding, GM we've of been, the year again. It's, it's we've, happening. We've been riding that wave for a while. It got a bit niggly earlier in the season. Then they had a really good patch. But now old uh, KD Kevin Durant is out injured, so it's back into checking how Sean Marks works through this smaller dose of adversity compared to what was happening earlier in the season but he he stayed solid and he got the brooklyn nets through a difficult patch as the gm so do want to big up sean marks as well imagine if jacques vaughan wins coach of the year because <laughs> that could happen like i think he was the top pick on the on the media survey that they did on the nba website imagine if jacques vaughan wins coach of the year um i don't think sean marks will get it because some damage was done to his reputation by some of that off-season stuff but he if he hires the coach of the year that's basically his award you know we won't worry about how he got there but yeah no yeah <laughs> outcomes busy times in the aotearoa cricketing landscape we have four trophy a couple of four trophy games were played during the week and then we're in this weird patch where it's a bit of four trophy, bit of super smash, bit of super smash, bit of HBJ shield. So we're just kind of trying to flow with that. I will do a four trophy debrief tomorrow, Friday. So stay tuned for that. Um, those two four trophy games, basically what happened is Wellington smacked the shit out of Otago as they had done previously against Northern districts, I think prior to the super smash, like they just came out guns blazing. Ben Allen was in that team. He went ballistic. And Rachin Ravindra might be one of the best domestic cricketers going around right now just for his all-format mahi. Obviously, I mentioned Dean Foxcroft in the Super Smash. He's very good as well. But I think Ravindra is playing fantastic cricket in all three formats. So Wellington defeated Otago. And you also had Canterbury defeat Central Districts, which was led by Kim McClure. And Cam Fletcher scoring runs. McClure hit a century 100 not out. And that was only his second game of the season. And low key, he's got a uh, list day, one day batting average of 40, over 40. I think it's 43. So his, his second game of the season, he played a Super Smash game. Now his first four trophy game, and he's got a century. That's what he does. And it was a game winning knock because Canterbury were batting second. I think Brad Shamulian did score some runs for Central. Still the underground king. That's official. And obviously Cam Fletcher scoring runs is quite kind of important as well, given his stature in the Aotearoa wicket-keeping ranks. And of course, always interested in Canterbury's seam bowlers because it's a never-ending list of seamers down in Canterbury. Zach Folks 
played a recent Super Smash game and he was one of the best Canterbury seamers in that game. And then he took three wickets for Canterbury in this four trophy game as well. So add Zach Folks to the list of Canterbury seamers you need to know about. Obviously, we had Henry Shipley. He's just been caught promoted to the Black Caps. Um, Willow Rourke is a very tall seamer as well, like Kyle Jamison. And you've got other dudes, Fraser Sheet, Sean Davey. They're also in the mix. So Canterbury's seam bowling department is always interesting in the same way that Northern District's spin department is always interesting, especially in the Super Smash, because now you've got Tim Pringle joining both the Walker brothers, let alone Mitchell Santner as well. So those are just a couple of trends in the domestic cricket landscape. I'm also just interested in this uh, Under-19 World Cup for the women's side. Because I think there's some interesting stuff here because you've got Fran Jonas, Georgia Plummer, and Izzy Gaze, who are White Ferns, playing in that Under-19 World Cup. And then you've got a T20 World Cup also in South Africa afterwards. But my two players that I'm thinking a lot about are Izzy Sharp, a Canterbury batter, who did play a few Super Smash games. She smacked it around, which was fantastic to see. And also Kaylee Knight, Northern District Seema, who's got a bit about her as well. And those two let alone anyone else who wants to stand up and say, Yolza, I'm here, I'm a really good cricketer. I think there's a chance some of these under-19 players outperform the White Ferns in this under-19 squad, which will just, just an interesting storyline to keep track of. As I said, Super Smash and HBJ Shield continue, and I think we're going to get a White Ferns squad in the next couple of days because Australia named their t20 world cup squad so we'll be keeping an eye on that and of course we've got the black caps in pakistan where they won the second odi lost the first odi and i've got a couple of ideas here wildcard like less about how these games are going but just a couple of ideas off the top of my head first one is henry shipley because old mate henry shipley's gone from nibbling balls all around the place in aotearoa now he's in Pakistan where like, and this just tells you like informs um, folks about moving through the levels of sport because Henry Shipley has been seeming it up in Aotearoa. Now he goes to Pakistan with the Black Caps and his role, especially in that first ODI, what are you, you're being told to dig slower balls into the pitch and you've got to like come out with all your bag of tricks and it's a very different role. Um, to what he was doing in Aotearoa and I think it's just part of his growth where it's just like you just want to put him in that situation where it's a difficult place to play for a seamer like him he was bowling 131 132 k's some sometimes a bit faster than that as well so I don't think he's going to be anything great in the series if he does play again but it's a massive learning occasion for Henry Shipley in the same way like Finn Allen hasn't fired and it's, a, it's his first time playing in Pakistan as well. So those younger lads, you're looking for experience because who scores the most runs for Black Caps? Stephen Conway, it's Kane Williamson. And in the test series, it was Tom Latham and I suspect in the 30 ODI, Tom Latham will score some runs. And as long as they're scoring the runs, they're the three best batters, that's all good. Also got the continuation of the spin funk here wildcard. East Sodi took a couple of wickets. He missed the first ODI and came in for Henry Shipley, which says nothing about Henry Shipley. Like, I think picking him for the first ODI was all good because you want to get him in there. You want to provide that experience to him. But I think the black, best Black Caps ODI team for this series features East Sodi as well as all the other spinners. So uh, I don't think Shipley will play a third ODI, but I do, I am impressed with the uh, the Black Cap spinners. Michael Brace was going all right. You got Santner, Glenn Phillips is, he's doing some things. He's doing some things as the uh, funkiest cricketer, the most exciting cricketer in the world. And one more thing, the Black Caps are at the top of the Cricket World Cup Super League. So they're at the bottom of the World Test Championship, but they're at the top of the ODI Super League. Very different. But 
um, quite interesting, especially when you consider that Pakistan haven't lost many games. Like Pakistan are also one of the best teams in that Super League as well. So just a bit of context and background around the Black Caps ODI team, which did add a did have a bit of softness when we were thinking about like the ODIs against Australia last year. And so I think this third and final ODI against Pakistan will be quite interesting given it's a it's a difficult place to play against Pakistan. Baba Azam is just churning out 50 plus scores. Pakistan are a pretty good ODI team themselves. Interesting. How are you viewing this Black Caps versus Pakistan ODI series yourself or based on any of those notes I just delivered? Yeah, I'm just having a peek at who we actually played in their Super League so far to be at the top. Um, there were home series, 3-0 sweep of Bangladesh, 3-0 sweep of Netherlands, and then that 1-0 series victory over India, very rain-affected. Um, away from home, swept 3-0 by Australia, but uh, away series wins over Ireland and West Indies, and then there's this Pakistan series, which is tied 1-0. So it's a little bit tougher than I thought. I mean, three of their five defeats, I think it is, have come against... Um, Australia and Australia. So there's <laughs> most teams lose there. So it's a nice thing to say that they've, um, it, it's not all been steady pickings against teams that they're expected to beat. Like they may have got swept by that, but they're, they've taken care of the rest of the business. And that was a good win against Pakistan in the second, in the second game. I um, fell asleep late in the first innings. So I didn't see any of our bowling. And by the point I went to sleep, I think Bracewell had just got out. So we're about seven or eight down and looking like at one point when Conway and Williamson were going along beautifully, it's like, well, they're going to get 300 plus here. There it was like, well, they might get bowled out for 240. Um, looks like Mitchell Santner got them through to some, um, some decent, uh, at least something defendable. And then the spinners did the, did the job after I think uh, Sally got a wicket, didn't he? And I think Ferguson might have as well. Getting annoyed by these Pakistan things, there's the old SkyGo app or whatever it's called these days. doesn't have the highlights up in the morning. It'd be nice if they would, you know, help a brother out there so I could catch up. But yeah, there's a good solid win there backed by their spin bowling. And... I agree that you sort of got to give Henry Shipley at least one game if you're going to take him on here. I don't think that one game should have come at the expense of each Sodi, who was the best bowler in the test series, and then suddenly doesn't play the first Sodi guy they lose, comes back in. I think it was about the third spin he used. He's Bracewell and Santner ahead of him, but that doesn't matter. That's just the that's just the state of the innings. You those guys can bowl in the power play. It's the main difference. Um and all three of those guys bowled well, plus Glenn Phillips came in and got a wicket. Like it was the spinners who did the job with a little bit of like mix it up at top of the innings and a little bit spread out throughout from Salvi and Ferguson. That's the way their bowling lineup should look in this series. And I think it is how that's going to look in the, the third ODI on Friday. Um, this has been a really good tour, not just series, like the, both the series is really good tour for East Sodi so far, hasn't it? And I think it's, probably been a really good tour overall for Michael Bracewell, specifically with the ball. Like, it's his, his spin bowling, which has been the main thing. His batting's been sketchy. Um, but he had a nice knock, I think, in the first ODI. And in the last innings of the of the Test Series, he he pulled off his first Test Match 50, 70-something not out. It was a, a steady innings. It wasn't the... You sort of thought he would throw out a few more fireworks when he's sort of batting to set up a declaration. But it was actually sort of nerdling the ball around which is what started to get him in a, in a run scoring flow so it was quite good to see from him um especially after he had really struggled playing against some of the spinners that pakistan had thrown at him um earlier in that series but like he's had one or two nice knocks with the bat so he had a, a lovely 50 odd um i think 60 or whatever it was in the first test Santner had an important knock here and in, in this uh second odi um uh, who else were Glenn Phillips hasn't done much yet, but he's he's Glenn Phillips, so he will at some point. It's more a little lack of opportunity, but all the all the spinners are chipping in nicely with the bat as well. So I, I know that that's something that the Black Cap selectors will be happy to see. And I think it's it's a little bit it's a little bit interesting in terms of where because obviously you go to Pakistan, you need to pick more spinners. They're never going to use four spinners in an innings 
and I said, oh, that's just not going to happen. There's no conditions in which that's going to be the beneficial uh, strategy. In Pakistan, it is. And those spinners are doing quite well. With the potential exception, I might, I might suggest, I'm not sure AJS Patel, uh, A, I'm not sure AJS Patel's just the, the work he did in the test series, I'm not sure it was up to his, his expected standards. But also, I think probably... You know, seeing Michael Bracewell and East Sodi bowling a lot more overs than him, particularly in that in that second test when in the fourth innings when they're really going for it, it wasn't till relatively late that Patel could even get into a, a decent spell. Not sure what he'd be thinking about that, but then also watching it, it's like he's your number one spinner coming into the series. And he's not the guy, he's like the third choice guy that you're trusting in this situation. But then also I'm watching this being like, well, Southie's doing the right thing because he should be the third choice because the other two have looked more threatening. And I, so I wonder what that means for Ajaz Patel moving forward because there was a, it was a, sorry, a headline on, I think it was an RNZ opinion piece, have, having a right old bone because um, Ajaz Patel wasn't nominated for Sportsman of the Year at the Helberg Awards. So it must be that time of the year again. I'm like, well, why would he get nominated for the Helberg Awards? He had one good game. Like, that, admittedly, that game was incredible. He took all ten wickets in an innings. It was, it was special. It was historic. It's not a year's worth of work. He hasn't actually done much for the Black Caps outside of that at all. Like, this was a trend coming into this tour, and he was the third most effective spinner in the Test series in the most spin-friendly conditions he's going to get to play in for a, a wee while. I, I wonder what that does for Ajaz Patel moving forward. Eh? Especially because he wasn't dominant in domestic cricket after no, taking yeah. those, uh, I think he took 14 wickets in the test against India in Mumbai. So you can kind of see how we got to this point with Ajaz Patel. He had a fantastic tour of India and a, a Mumbai magic, as we've said numerous times. But if you look at every juncture since then, he hasn't been a dominant force. So you can see clearly how we got here. And that's also reason to be cautious with what's happening with East Sodi. Like, Ajaz Patel had a very good Indian test. Didn't do much after it. East Sodi is having a very good Pakistan tour. What's he going to do after it? Because all that matters is taking wickets in these spinner positions and that's how you keep getting selected. And I don't like, yeah, we can look at how the Black Caps should build their attack for this Pakistan ODI series. Isodi hasn't been a consistent figure in the ODI team. He's not even been a consistent figure in ODI squads. So when you're looking at how the Black Caps build their ODI team, it's usually around one finger spinner outside of Asian conditions and then it's usually get another finger spinner in who can bat um, but as we're seeing East Sodi can hold a bat and we're also seeing that um, Mitchell Santner is a specialist spinner so you expect a certain velocity vigor revs that he gets on the ball like that is his skill set that is his art form same with East Sodi like you are going to hear the ball turning as it comes down the pitch you look at what Michael Bracewell and Glenn Phillips do. They call Michael Bracewell beastie. He's a beast. He's a big lad. Like, the black cap's black cap barely fits on his head. Michael Bracewell is a unit. And he gets a lot of revs on his deliveries. And the more revs you get, the more dip you're going to get, the more spice off the pitch you're going to get. Glenn Phillips, what do we know about him? The most exciting cricketer in the world. There was a, in the first ODI, there was him and Kane Williamson chasing the ball to the boundary. Kane Williamson was on a treadmill. And Glenn Phillips was just like, boom, gone. And he almost got the ball at the boundary. But like him and Bracewell, they're putting their same physical energy into their spinning deliveries. So you can see how they are effective as spinners and what their how their physical attributes apply to spin bowling. I think that's um, going to be in Bracewell's favor, especially because he, he does get a lot of, like, I think he's probably similar height to Sodi, maybe a bit shorter than Santner. So he's going to get the same amount of uh, bounce and the same delivery 
the same area of release in his delivery. Again, we're coming back to Aotearoa after this. So I am cautious about celebrating any of these spinners coming back to Kiwi conditions, but it does set up a fascinating third ODI because someone needs to win the game for the Black Caps. Will, will it be a spinner? Because if a spinner can stand up in that stage and win the game for the Black Caps, that's a massive knot. Or is it going to be a batter? Maybe it's Tom Latham. We'll wait and see. But I do want to highlight one stat here, Wildcard, or a couple of stats. Old D Conway, Dev Con. How about that one? Dev, Dev Con. Con. <laughs> like that. Dev Con currently has the third best T20 international batting average ever. I've mentioned T20 cricket. That's the one where Chris Harris is first. T20 internationals. Devin Conway is third. Rizwan is second. Virat Kohli is first. Test batting average. Devin Conway. He is now ranked 20th. All of these have a minimum of 20 innings. So Devin Conway has just got over that hump. Devin Conway doesn't have as good an average as Daryl Mitchell. Daryl Mitchell is the best Kiwi. He is ranked 12th. He's got a test batting average of 58.35. Devin Conway has a test batting average of 54.76. And then Kane Williamson is 53.8. So Devin Conway, third best T20 international batting average. Devin Conway, 20th best test batting average. And Mr. Conway hasn't quite reached the minimum marker in ODI cricket, but he's got an ODI batting average of 43.83 after 13 innings. And that puts him behind Kane Williamson, 47.8, Latudu Taylor, 47.55, and Glenn Turner, 47. So curiously tracking Devin Conway's ODI cricket, because once he hits that 20 innings marker, He's probably going to be, given how he's scoring runs, he's probably going to be top 25, top 20. And then suddenly Devin Conway is one of the best batters in the world. And that's pretty awesome because you've also got Kane Williams and you've also got Tommy Latham. So I definitely like a bit of that. He's had a really good tour as well, hasn't he? Because I think it's, like when you mentioned shipley and ellen and some of the younger guys in the team playing a series like this for the first time it's i can't imagine devon conway's played too much where well, he wouldn't have played any cricket in pakistan i don't think anyone in this squad would have played cricket in pakistan unless they've played psl um one or two of them might have i don't know but even that a lot of that was in the uae too so but even just in general in these kind of conditions would have been relatively rare for for a few of these fellas and conway i think because, you know, he scored a 100 in the Test Series, and I think he had another 90-odd or something as well in the first Test, and there's a 100 in the second ODI after <laughs> two Golden Ducks in a row, one at the end of the Test Series and one at the start of the ODI Series. So he's he's not looked... Like, the reason I think it's been a really good series for him is because he's scored runs, clearly. Like, he's scored some good runs. He's got 100 in each of the um, formats and another decent innings in one of the other ones. So, like, that's good. That's That's solid runs. But it also hasn't felt like it's been the kind of flawless flowing innings that you've seen from him in the past. And I think he's really had to grind out a few of his runs. And there have he's been batting knowing that there are a few weaknesses that Pakistan know they can target. I think um, uh, so it's I think it's off spinners around the wicket is something that you see a lot against him. Um, sort of trying to cramp him up but move the ball away. Uh, it's not a not an uncommon left handed thing. I can't remember. What, I can't remember if that was exactly what it was, but definitely during the T Twenty World Cup, they looked at. I remember them showing a graphic on the broadcast where it's like Conway against right arm seam averages massive. Like his strike rate massive, average massive. Left arm seam massive, massive. Um, Leg spin, massive, massive. Off spin, suddenly is the, the like a notable drop off. I, I think that was it. Um, so yeah, like the Pakistan have had plans to bowl for him, and it, it hasn't always been easy for him to to get underway in his innings, and then to once he's kicked in, he's gone on to make relatively big scores. But I think getting underway has been a bit tricky for him. Yet he's done so more often than not. Like I think that's a, another good sign from him because you get guys like. I mean, your ultimate example is Matthew Sinclair coming into Test cricket way back when, scoring a couple double hundreds, 
And then everyone's like, well, this guy's going to be incredible. And then against tougher oppositions, suddenly not in your own backyard, the runs dry up and he was never ever that batsman again. Um, except at domestic level, an absolute killer in domestic cricket throughout his whole career. But Devin Conway has clearly avoided that little hold up. Like he, he's clearly, we, we already knew he was an elite batsman. We, we knew this about him. It's not a surprise to see it, but he is showing it. And that's important. Like that's an important step in a, in a batter's uh, repertoire. No, um, just, just journey in international cricket, I suppose. It's like, I'm not telling you this as a major point, but it like, it is important to note the difference between, because Devin Conway does feel new to the international cricket scene. Yeah. He's also 31 years old and he's played 122 first class games, 137 T20 games, 97 list day, one day games. So he's got ample experience. Yeah, sure. Not in Pakistani conditions, but this is the difference between having a Black Caps team that is generally around the age of 30 years old and the likes of Will Young, Daryl Mitchell, um, those type of lads, Tom Blundell, those type of lads who come into the Black Caps set up a little bit older, they are far more mature. They know their games. They know how to make the in incremental improvements series to series that to remain successful at this level. Where the younger players, you're looking at um, maybe they are successful, maybe they are not, but it's harder for them to figure out what is working, what is not working, because all of that stuff, Devin Conway, Will Young, Daryl Mitchell, they were doing that for five, seven, ten years in domestic cricket before they got there. And I think we're seeing the guys who are successful, they have played a lot of domestic cricket in Aotearoa, which sets them up to make quick improvements in the international arena. Even Glenn Phillips has a bit of that because Glenn Phillips was playing domestic cricket when he was 18 years old, like as a teenager making an impact. And he's played a lot of cricket around the world already. Like he's been a CPL star. He's been in the T20 stuff in England. He's played county cricket. He has been around the world working on his game so it's not a massive adjustment for him coming into a series like this. You can either, we'll move into football. We've got a bit of Phoenix and a bit of Flying Kiwis. So I know the Flying Kiwis stuff is uh, jam packed. The jar of jam is overflowing, which probably doesn't mean it's great jam because then it's all liquidified. So. Uh, maybe we'll just say jam pack, like the jar is full with jam and the Flying Kiwis uh, realms. So do you want to drop a quick little uh, Wellington Phoenix note and then get into some Flying Kiwis? Um, yeah, quick little Wellington Phoenix note. Uh, where should we go with this? I mean, did you, watch, did you watch the end of that Sydney game? Did you see that on Saturday night? Oh, I did not. You did not? You missed the absolute drama of it all that <laughs> Two red cards, both of them dodgy red cards, a couple of dodgy penalties. The second one looked a stonewall penalty, but also like I will point out that Dudu, Dudu won the rebound, who then kicked it into Callan Elliott for the handball. Was encroaching in the penalty area when the kick was taken. So if you're going to go to VAR to find a handball, it seems weird you didn't rewind literally two seconds to see that he was also illegally in the penalty area to get to that ball first. So um, absolute carnage from a from a officiating point of view but from the point of view of the phoenix specifically just being on the end of it um it's because i at this point i'm kind of immune to hearing um in particular i will i'll pick on them and say in particular warriors fans complaining about how the refs hate them and the nrl doesn't want them to succeed and everything's a stitch up it's a conspiracy against them um Phoenix fans certainly have a fair bit of that as well. I've, I don't think I've ever seen a Warriors game that felt like that, though. Um, and I'd never seen a Phoenix game that felt like that before either. There's been situations in each where it's like a bad decision late in the game might cost you. And obviously that's going to hurt as a fan or as a player, or as a coach, whatever. It's going to hurt when a bad call goes against you. But a bad call could go against you at any point. It's just when it happens to happen late in the game where it feels decisive all of a sudden. 
to get four bad calls against you in the space of 20 minutes at the end when you're away from home against Sydney FC, powerhouse club. Um, also, there's that thing about how Sydney have bought the rights to host the next three or four grand finals, whatever it is. Um, bit of an overrated talking point. I, I actually felt that that might be me going against the grain there, but still, as far as I'm concerned, you, it's nice to have your, it would be nice to have a home grand final for the Wellington Phoenix. At the moment, I'd just like to see the Wellington Phoenix make a grand final first. Like I, I think at that point, beggars can't be choosers. Um, and they're not going to finish first this season. So Melbourne City are going to finish first. They're just going to have to find a way to beat them at some point in the, um, in the playoffs. So, I mean, it was baffling to watch it because it's, it's still, it's, it's not a conspiracy. It's not a stitch up. It's not, it's just a bad luck on top of bad luck where it's something, you know, just a bunch of decisions compounded against the Phoenix, but they still won that game. And I've, I can't remember ever having a, a fan experience like that, where it feels like you're just being subjected to the worst torture. It's like, even when Ollie Sales saves that penalty, like it, 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 each of the red cards, it's like, well, damn. Oh, okay, but we're, we're still winning. We'll sit back deeper. Um, a second red card. Okay, but we're still winning. We'll sit back even deeper. We just got to hold on. It's only five minutes plus stoppage time to go. When suddenly you're conceding a penalty in stoppage time, it's like, well, if they score this as the guy is expected to do. You don't. You're not winning anymore. Like there's nothing to cling to at that point. You've you've lost your lead. Um, so for then. So that's what it feels like when it's taken a penalty against you. And then Oli Sale saves it. And then they give another penalty. So you just like you're going from you're going from the highs to the lows, like peaks and troughs. It's it's just an unreal experience going through the ringer, even just watching it on television. I can't remember, but like Ufuk Tele was blowing up massive, and so were his assistants on the sideline. And I, I actually think they probably conducted themselves quite reasonably under the situation. I can imagine it being a lot worse for some coaches. Uh, like credit to them for that. But then for the dude to miss the second penalty, it was just absolutely insane. And as I said in the in the uh, variety show on on Monday, I kind of feel like that might be the sort of game that the Wellington Phoenix needed in order to start getting a bit of consistency in their season and going on a a run of victories and and capitalizing on you know they've, they've dropped twelve points from winning positions so far. If they had those twelve points, they'd be first on the ladder. Like this is a good team. They they're not. Um, They've been inconsistent, but it's not been because they're playing badly. It's just because little things they haven't capitalized on. They've conceded sloppy goals. They haven't scored enough. Um, like in the other penalty area, not converted some of their chances. They've actually taken two penalties themselves this year, missed them both. So it's not, not ideal that. They're also missing penalties, but it's nice that it happened against them as well. Um, yeah, just, just wild, baffling, uh, very confusing, outrageous moments throughout that game but it also it's the kind of thing where I, I suspect that bands you together as a as a team and i think maybe they needed a bit of that and also as i said in the variety show as well needed just needed a little bit of the chip on their shoulder again and needed to um needed to have something to fight against and not be like a a calmly respected opponent throughout the a-league like let's get a little bit of the mongrel back in there and and feel play with your backs against the wall some more and um i hope that result sets them up in, in quite a positive run because they, they have some decent enough fixtures coming up and I think they Central Coast Mariners have shown in the last month month of good football and this season there's only one runaway team it's Melbourne City like other than that it's wide open from from second to the bottom of the table pretty much like the Melbourne victory are last Sydney FC are a couple spots below the Phoenix those teams obviously could get good they're not, they're not particularly great at the moment but they could get good they, they got money they could make some transfers um it's a like three or four wins in a row is going to surge you up the ladder Central Coast have done that recently they've had a few really good results and they have gone rocketing up the ladder the Phoenix could do that too like that's that's what they're that's what the aim is and I think I'm I'm hoping that this game spurs them on to do exactly that because they are good enough to do it. They're good enough to make a playoff run. And I want to see that from them this season, you know? All of which sounds like you're pretty optimistic about them absorbing the loss of Ben Wayne. Like they seem to have the yep. um like what we're saying at the top of the podcast, you're selling one of your best young players. And not only do you receive a decent chunk of money. 
you've also got the players to absorb that loss and keep trucking along. So I think that's pretty positive. Moving into the Flying Kiwi section, you can touch on Ben Wayne's situation with Plymouth Argyle, is it? That's the one. Plymouth Argyle. Is there anyone else? uh, What else perks your antenna up on the Flying Kiwis beat aside from Ben Wayne? Well, it's a hectic time because it's there's been a World Cup break. There's been a lot of winter breaks. Some of them are still going to continue for a couple more weeks, but a lot of other leagues are coming out of those winter breaks in the last week and this upcoming weekend. Um, and that just means there's a lot more football being played. And there was also, it's not just that there weren't that many games being played late last year. It's also the case of guys like, you know, Joe Bell wasn't starting for Bromby. Uh, Marco Stamanich had uh, wait, the last four games of the season, um, or the last four games of the year, rather, leading into their World Cup break for Copenhagen. He didn't play them either. Uh, I've since found out there's a wee bit of an injury thing is why he was sort of, he was on the bench a couple of times, but he's on the bench as like a injured, but could play in case of an emergency style thing. So there's a little bit more of that, but also he's now said he's not going to, uh, not going to re-sign with Copenhagen when his contract expires at the end of the year. And I, Seems reading the tea leaves here, I'm relatively confident. I think he's going to end up at Red Star Belgrade before the end of uh, the January transfer window, which I would love to see. I think that'd be a fantastic move for him. Um, uh, where, who else we got? Libby Kikache, been sitting on the bench watching the dude who he was alternating minutes with last season have a massive breakout year. Uh, Fabiano Parisi is his name. And he actually got called out for the Italian squad not long ago, which is Pretty decent work if you're playing for Empoli, who are like a sort of mid-table, lower mid-table team. It'd be like playing for, um, getting called up for England, playing for Southampton or something like that, which happens, but it just shows you've got to be one of the best dudes out there. So that's the guy that's keeping Libby Kikache out of the team. But if you're doing well for Empoli, suddenly Inter Milan want you. Suddenly, like, uh, you know... um, I can't remember what the other teams are. There were a couple of teams that were mentioned and also there were teams that weren't mentioned, but it's like so-and-so or like interest from this league, from that league. Hopefully he gets sold before January and Kakache moves up. Um, Bell's got a new coach. So there's every chance that with a new coach, a bit of a reset, he might come back into the starting lineup there. Um, Staminich could be moving and playing a lot in that case. You've got Sapreet Singh who wasn't allowed to play because they botched his registration after he was out injured pretty much since February. Um, it's been a long time since he's played. He'll be eligible to play when they come back in. I think it's the week after this. Um, I'm not sure. It could be this weekend. I'd have to check that. Um, so Sapreet Singh could be back playing football for the first time in a long time. And if you're talking about long droughts without playing footy, Ryan Thomas went 461 days since his last competitive game of football when he came on the pitch last weekend for for his first appearance in his second spell at Pex Voller. Um that's a, it's a long drought out, but he's back now. Like, there's a lot of these situations. Um, on the women's side, Rebecca Stott hasn't played yet for Brighton since she re-signed for them because she had off-season ankle injury. She made the bench a couple of times towards the end of the last year, and she should be back fit and ready to go when the when that league resumes. Probably still a couple months away for Rhea Percival and her, her ACL recovery, but, you know, there's a lot of examples here just as a as a highlight of what to look forward to in Flying Kiwis in the start of 2023. A lot of players who are top-tier players as well, not been playing much football, going to start playing a lot of... Well, at least a couple of them certainly are going to start playing a lot more football. And hopefully a, hopefully a few others have at least avenues into where they might get back into regular first-team minutes again as well. How do you reflect upon that World Cup break? Like, is it kind of like put a positive twist now where it's just set up all this intrigue for the Flying Kiwis beat? Is it, was it like, uh, do you look back on it with frustration? How do you reflect on that? Well, I mean, it was obviously a stupid idea to have the World Cup in the middle of the season um, because it was a stupid idea to have a World Cup in Qatar in the first place. But that's a whole other can of worms. Um, taking it from an it is what it is perspective, I think it's just case by case. Like there's there's situations where say, because um, obviously the women didn't have a World Cup break, they kept playing through. They just some of them have winter breaks over the, or holiday breaks for a couple of weeks around Christmas. Um, there are, there are cases where players benefit from that because there are no games being played and you're out injured and you need time to recover. Well, if you're recovering at a time where they're not playing any games, you're not missing any games. 
Um, they're also situation like I think Ryan Thomas is a good example of that. It's nice that they had an extra he had an extra basically month to recover because they don't play games over the the coldest, snowiest point of winter in the Netherlands. Um and the World Cup break just added to that as well. Although not so much because the division he's in, they didn't have so much of a break. It's only a couple of weeks. Um, sort of like the A-League wasn't as long as the Premier League, you know. Uh, but there are also situations where it's like for Chris Wood, it might have been nice for him to be able to get some more games in while Alexander Isak was out injured because he's the he's the opposite of this trend where it's for the first time on the midweek game, they won 2 0 against Leicester City to make the semi finals of the League Cup. First game all season in which Callum Wilson, Alexander Isak, Chris Wood all in the same match day squad, all fit and available at the same time. And Chris Wood was an unused sub. So unfortunately, that might be a trend that follows in, in, in the opposite direction of these other great uh, happy comeback stories. There might also be the Chris Wood opposite way. That is the niche cast. Pick it up yourself. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Tap in and we'll be back with another podcast next week. Cha-cha.